We are recording. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. This is Brian King with Eurasia, Texas, and uh, we are in our October speaker series. Uh, today, Addie LeBron is going to host for us. Uh, and uh, if you uh, just got here, please uh, do uh, rename your name and the participant ID to your first and last name so we can send you PDH. We will be posting this on our Google YouTube account afterwards, I believe, if, if the permissions come through uh, uh, good. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Addie introduce our participants today and uh, and uh, hope you all have a great session. And, and Mike and everybody, thank you all for doing this. Addie, I'll let you take it away. Sure. Uh, well, again, thanks, everyone. Welcome. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, November is right around the corner. And of course, it's GIS Day. So if you haven't already done so, send us an email with your event details so we can include you in our GIS Day website tab. We will also be conducting multiple mapping hours throughout the state of Texas for GIS Day. So just to stay tuned in to event invites in your area. Um, lastly, if you have any job openings that you would like University of Texas to share, um, just send us an email with the details and we'll get that posted on our GIS jobs forum. Um, our email, uh, email address is info at uristatexas.org. I also included that in the chat window if you need it. Um, our starting speaker today is Michael Wiemet. He's the Unit Chief for Operations Technology for the Texas Division of Emergency Management Te Technology Services Section in Austin, Texas. Um, Mike, thank you for being here with us, especially with the Houston events, um, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Eddie. Oops. Um, there we go. Uh, one housekeeping item before I get started. Edward Cohn, if you're listening in, we can see a live broadcast of you driving right now, so I'm not sure if you want to have that happening. Ah, very good. Thank you. Um, so welcome. This is the, uh, we're doing a presentation today on ArcGIS Survey 123 Prelimin Preliminary Damage Assessment App. And uh, we have uh, three great speakers lined up for you today. Um, and as Addie said, this is uh, myself, uh, Michael Wiemet, uh, with Cheatham Operations Technology. And here's my email address. I'll leave it up just for a couple seconds. So our speakers today are Marla Wise. She's a grant coordinator with Tetum Recovery. She's gonna talk about the preliminary damage assessment process. Our second speaker is Chris Kundrock. He's an emergency management specialist with FEMA Recovery in Washington, DC. He's gonna give an overview of the Survey123 PDA app. And then finally, Melissa Jerns, uh, GIS developer for Tetum Operations Technology, We'll talk about best practices for using the Survey123 PDA app, and then we'll wrap up with questions and some uh, resource slides. Just a quick uh, couple notes about uh, who I work for, which is the Texas Division of Emergency Management. We are the uh, state emergency management agency for the state of Texas. Every state has one. We are. Um, charged with a, um, providing a comprehensive all-hazard emergency management program for the state, including assisting, assisting cities, counties, and state agencies, both in planning and implementing their emergency management programs. We are a statewide um, agency, and we serve uh, six different regions where we have staff deployed in each of the regions. A real note, uh, or recent note, on September 1st, TETAM became a state agency under the Texas A&M University as a result of 2019 legislation. Um, I get asked the question all the time, does that mean that TETAM is going to be moving to College Station? And the answer is no. Uh, we will remain in Travis County, but we will continue uh, going forward, um, strengthening our um, university ties, and we uh, anticipate we'll have great opportunities in the future to collaborate on emergency management research and education going forward in the future. Texas is a very busy state in terms of emergency management. Uh, we are the number one state for uh, major disaster declarations since 1953. In total, 98 disaster declarations from 1953 to 2019. 
So that's an average of one major disaster declaration every eight months. I went through our Web EOC crisis management information system last night and looking at the number of SOC incidents we've had. And we've averaged 26 incidents over the last five years. Now, incident may not be a major declaration, but uh, some of them are. Um, and so if you look through, even though like 2017 was a little bit slower year than average, that included Hurricane Harvey, which was a very, very busy event for us. Just in the last two months, uh, we've experienced tropical storm in Melda in southeast uh, Texas, and now we're dealing with the tornado event in the Dallas area, Fort Worth area. So again, very busy. There's lots of opportunities to use this new app going forward because of all um, how busy we are as a state. We just began using the uh, the Survey One Two Three PDA PDA app with uh, at TDM with FEMA. Um, starting last June for the Lower Rio Grande uh, Tropical Storm event. Since then, we've used the, um, the app six different times, including uh, for the most recent event up uh, for the Dallas uh, tornadoes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Marla Wise, our grant coordinator for TM Recovery, and she's going to talk about the Thank you, Michael. She's going to talk about the um, PDA coordination process. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Marla Wise. I have been serving as our state PDA coordinator, um, most recently for the Imelda incident. Um, so, what is a PDA? Um, from the state perspective, a preliminary damage assessment. Um, it's a state level tool that we use to gather information um, on the impact of the disaster, uh, what locations are damaged, how damaged are they, where are they located, um, how does this damage affect uh, the local area. Um, the state conducts these preliminary damage assessments, PDAs, to validate the extent of the damage, not to identify it. Um, and to a point, we start doing PDAs to determine whether or not the damage is sufficient to warrant the state requesting a major disaster declaration. Um, on the official side of things, we've got two types, public assistance and individual assistance. Um, those are FEMA designations. Public assistance will uh, give aid to local jurisdictions, non private nonprofits, critical infrastructure, school districts. Individual assistance, um, it helps homeowners and renters um, recover from the impact of a disaster on their living arrangements. So, <clears throat> I like to use preliminary damage assessment for the official kind because it's, it's the state has to report numbers up to FEMA for that one. Um, but a jurisdiction can conduct a damage assessment Anytime we need them to do that after a, da after a disaster to complete what we call damage summary outline, which lets them uh, give the state numbers for how many, you know, how many homes have been damaged. Um, how, what's the impact on the local jurisdiction? How much have they spent on, uh, on emergency response? Or how many of their buildings have gotten flooded? How many of their roads have washed away? That sort of thing. Um, and so we, we can encourage jurisdictions to use um, GIS technology to do their own damage assessments because that will help us when we go um, to FEMA and say, hey, we've had a lot of damage. We need to set up a team to do a joint PDA between FEMA and the state and go out and look at what the jurisdiction is reporting. So here's a quick map. Disaster occurs, our local jurisdictions, assess their damage and submit their, their DSOs. Up here at the state, I or my P, uh, PDA coordinator counterparts um, will review these DSOs. We tally up the um, amounts that they're reporting and um, kind of get a feeling for how bad it is. Um, the counties will submit a request for a PDA, for a preliminary damage assessment to the state, and we will go out and arrange the official uh, PDAs. 
So uh, in this case, who does them? The local jurisdictions will do them to, dam to determine how much damage they've had in their area. Uh, the Red Cross does a version to de determine how much the Red Cross will have to be involved in the recovery process. Small Business Asso Association does damage assessment to determine uh, whether the area will be uh, needing low interest SBA loan programs. Uh, the state does them to justify our response and FEMA does them to justify uh, major disaster declarations and federal assistance. Um, any of these can use a Survey123 type tool. Um, the state and FEMA are the ones who are officially doing it right now. And so from, the, from my perspective, this is just a quick slide. Um, part of what we need the uh, data from the jurisdictions for is to determine how much time to devote to these PDAs. Um, is it primarily residential damage or is it primarily public infrastructure damage? Um, based on the coordinates we get, do we need specialists? Um, and then the validate not, not identify is very key for this because what we want from the jurisdictions before we send a team out is to have a map, have GPS coordinates of their damaged locations so that when our teams go out, they know where they're going. Um, individual assistants will survey residential areas. Um, the team will include state and local representatives, FEMA personnel, and small business associations. They will take the Survey123 app with them to identify um, which homes have been affected. They record addresses and the extent of damage. Um, this will help us estimate the population affected and determine what type of assistance we have to roll out. Um, PDA teams from the, the joint state FEMA level are extremely, time, uh, extremely large time investment because they will go out and walk the street taking addresses and GPS coordinates and talking to the homeowners and getting you know, ownership or insurance information. Public assistance PDAs are, again, state, FEMA, and locals going out together to look at what damage the locals have identified. Um, we, we focus on public infrastructure and critical public service, serv services, sorry, um, school districts, bridges, roads, um, county buildings, city buildings, um, that type of thing. So, they take the Survey123 app with them, and it's a, a much longer form for them to fill out because it includes not just the addresses, but um, what category of damage it is, estimates for how much it's going to cost to fix it. Um, we have the ability to take pictures in the app. It's really, uh, it's been very nice. And it automatically records the GPS coordinates as long as you have a connection to the cell network. Um, once the team is done, they will report via the Survey123 app. Um, we've traditionally used paper forms, which does introduce a delay in determining what the PDA has discovered, has uh, verified. Um, Survey123 app feeds directly into a common operating picture, uh, which reports numbers as they are submitted. Um, so we can see the residential houses, we can see how many people that day were visited and recorded. Um, I will report on the data that is reported via the Survey123 app and via um, more traditional methods. Uh, the GIS team does a lovely picture, pictorial um, representations of the data that come in. And um, once we have finished our PDAs, we look at the overall picture and we say, hey, this is way beyond what we can handle, and we can request a major disaster declaration in order to get federal assistance or request federal assistance. Um, overall, it's uh, the the PDA process um, has been around for a long time before um, the Survey One Two Three has come on, but the Survey One Two Three has definitely shortened the time between um, gathering the data and being able to say, oh, this is worse than we thought it was. So, um, and again, having the GPS coordinates lets us go back 
two things and and see them more than once if we need to. We don't have to guess as to which addresses we've gone to. Great. Thank you, Marla. Marla will be available at the end for any questions that you may have. Our next speaker is uh, Chris Kundrock, Emergency Management Specialist with FEMA Recovery in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chris to uh, take over the presentation for his portion of the uh, presentation. And I'll leave this up just for a half a second here so you can uh, write down this email and it'll be available at the end as well. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Kundrock. I'm an emergency management specialist here at FEMA uh, at, in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm uh, working the recovery director uh, in the office of the assistant administrator uh, for recovery on the recovery operations team. And so our team is responsible for a myriad of different things, one of which is um, PDA program coordination, as well as um, PDA, the PDA tool. So um, what I'm going to do is share my screen uh, with you all um, as soon as I can get Zoom to cooperate. All right, are you able to see my screen? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> so, you know, as uh, as Mike spoke earlier, um, the the PDA tool um, is, is was originally developed uh, internal to FEMA. Um, you know, and we've been working on this project for about two and a half years or so. Um, and really, we identified kind of after some events and you know the. Uh, mid 2000s uh, with uh, you know, Hurricane Sandy and um, and uh, other events that had happened, we weren't collecting data uh, in a way that we could use it further. Um, and so what we were charged with doing is creating a tool that was, you know, uh, you know, scalable, as well as um, something that could be deployed on uh, FEMA issued equipment that did not require anything uh, other than that. So after an extensive, you know, search between all the different uh, things that come, you know, uh, as our commercial off the shelf products, um, we, we chose Esri and utilizing the Survey123 app. <clears throat> so, um, you know, when, when people refer to it as the, uh, the FEMA Survey123, um, really what we're doing is providing the templates. So we've built three different templates that we utilize here at FEMA that are shared um, publicly. Uh, so if you are interested in viewing those templates, uh, you can actually go to Survey123 Connect uh, through Esri and go, uh, if you create a new survey and in the community gallery, uh, if you type in uh, the letters PDA, you will find uh, the first thing, first three things that pop up are the FEMA templates. Um, and so we maintain those uh, through our RGIS online and, and ensure that they're pu published for everyone's use. It is important to note that um, currently, uh, if you use those templates, it does not automatically uh, report to FEMA. And so we, we just may make that uh, clear. So, you know, in, in Marla's presentation, she spoke about uh, IA and PA, so individual assistance and public assistance. Um, and so we've developed uh, two surveys that are for individual assistance and one for public assistance. And what I'm going to do today is just kind of take you through each of the surveys um, fairly quickly. I mean, not, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but we can uh, definitely I'll answer questions if you have them. Um, so first, if we were going out to do an assessment on uh, homes, and I apologize for the, uh, the how large the letters are on this. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with my uh, survey one, two, three. Um, on my computer. Um, so uh, right at the beginning, we have a link to the Damage Assessment Operations Manual, which is SEMA's piece of doctrine uh, that kind of sets the stage and sets that criteria for what um, we're assessing during a damage assessment. As you scroll down, we collect what's called the incident begin date. So that is a, a date that identifies the beginning of the incident. So um, for if you had multiple events within a short period of time, this is important to understand. So you can have um, 
you know, parsed out data in case you have multiple different requests that are happening. We do um, collect street address, city, town, um, and state. So if we were to select the state of Texas, we can then come down and select a county. So we'll say Anderson County. Um, we are currently, just a, just a side note, working on reverse geocoding uh, for our surveys. So that way it would, uh, um, we could identify this on the map and reverse geocode that to automatically fill this information. Um, and we found that to be helpful um, in uh, tornado events, especially when, you know, whole homes are, are gone and you're just not sure what the address might be. Uh, we do ask um, a question about tribal affiliation. So uh, if uh, there was a tribal affiliation with that household, you can um, select yes and then have the ability to um, select the tribe. And this is important because uh, tribal nations can be direct recipients from FEMA, so they can come separate uh, from their state and request uh, both individual and public assistance independent of their state uh, counterparts. We have uh, the different types of event or event types that cause damage. Um, and again, I apologize for how this is formatted on my screen here. Um, normally it doesn't look this way. <clears throat> but um, these are all the defined event types that could cause damage per uh, our doctrine. We do ask if there are any immediate needs. So say uh, a team is out in the field and they've identified someone with maybe um, uh, the need for uh, oxygen because they have a, a home concentrator, but they have no power now. Uh, the ability is to flag this um, and put an explanation. And on the FEMA side, we have a, have a dashboard that shows all the immediate needs. Um, <clears throat> so, think of you're standing in front of the house and you're, you're looking at it, you've filled out the address, you filled out the, you know, the essential kind of where you're at. And this is really where we get into the evaluation. So the first question is owner or renter. Um, at SEMA, um, we do provide assistance to both owners and renters, but the assistance varies. Um, we only provide what's called housing assistance, um, or I'm sorry, repair and replacement assistance um, to owner-occupied um, residents. So we ask this question, so we're able to parse out that data. <clears throat> um, we do collect insurance information, um, which helps us understand if this is maybe, let's say, a flood event. How many how many homes did we come in contact to that had flood insurance, or uh, is this uh, maybe a tornado that's covered under regular homeowners insurance? <laughs> Uh, as you can see, we have our levels of damage. So affected, minor, major, destroyed, inaccessible, and unaffected. Um, you may ask, why do we put it unaffected? Because you, there may be a time where you're out uh, in your jurisdiction and you need to record that you actually went to a home, um, and uh, but they didn't have any damage. So we'll say for the, the purpose of this demonstration that we're gonna put major and it's a single family home. As you can see, some conditional questions just dropped down. Um, and so we have different um, choices here based on the, uh, the damage level and the type of residence. These come out of the damage assessment operations manual as criteria for calling that um, residents major. So for instance, if this was a flood event um, and we had maybe 20 inches of water, you could select this. This is also helpful for identifying trends in your damage assessment. So if you wanted to know, well, why were all these majors? Then you could say, well, 90% of them had water above 18 inches, et cetera. Um, again, um, we only are looking at primary residents. So primary residents are uh, um, defined as an uh, occupied residence at least six months per year. And that is not a, a vacation home or a home under construction, but somebody actually lives in that residence at least six months per year. We do uh, have the ability to track, you know, utilities just as the data point. 
And then we have this question here uh, to be able to flag assessments for the PDA coordinator as a, as a, um, maybe there's an issue or maybe there's a, a clarification needed for um, the, the level of damage. And they, the field user can submit this surveying and it's you know, automatically flagged onto an operations dashboard with the uh, request for the PDA coordinator to, um, to review it. We do capture additional narratives. So if somebody was out in the out uh, doing assessments and came across a unique situation or had to needed to record additional information about that residence, that's uh, no problem. Um, do you have the map question in here? So it will automatically, you know, pull your location based on your internal GNSS receiver, uh, as you can see. If I scroll in, uh, I'm sitting oops, right about here in this building. Um, and so maybe I wanted to mark that. And then we have the ability to upload three photos attached of this assessment. You may be thinking, man, that's a lot of questions you have to answer. Um, our, our field staff can do an assessment in about 60 to 90 seconds per residence um, once they uh, once they kind of get a, a couple behind their belt um, and uh, and we the fidelity of the data has allowed us to do some incredible things. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to exit the IA survey and I'm going to quickly cover the IA what we call the IA Express um, just so you can see the quick differences. So the IA Express was designed in um, in a request basically from the, the regions to say hey, you know, what if we have a lot of residences that we just have to hit quickly? Um, and we needed something a little bit more uh, towards our, um, uh, you know, kind of back to the tick sheets, but we, we recognize we want this to be electronic. Um, so as you can see, most of the information that we're collecting at the forefront is the same. And um, this is where it changes. So we asked this type of dwelling assessed. We can do a single family home, a street, a block, a named subdivision or mobile home park or a multifamily structure. So uh, we'll, we'll say that uh, we're going into the Windy Acre subdivision and that's at 123 Windy Lane and it's Windy Acres. So as I scroll down, you can see these spinners have populated with each damage level. So if I knew that um, we had 15 affected homes, 20 minors, 30 majors, 100 destroyed, not 1,000, that'd be a lot. Um, and maybe we couldn't get to 25 of them because they uh, were blocked by the road was washed out and we couldn't get to the back of the subdivision. So I've essentially just uh, recorded 190 assessments on one survey. Uh, the the a little bit of downside to this is the fact that you don't have the GPS points for each residence. Um, but if you're if you're and we tell our staff if you're using this, it's because you it's just not feasible for you to go visit those. Um, but as we've, we've demonstrated, um, you know, with a couple of teams and, um, you know, maybe three or four teams, and uh, we can do about four to 500 assessments, um, or I'm sorry, we can do about 150 to 200 assessments a day um, per team. So uh, recently, I think for Tropical Storm and Melda, they did, a, you know, 3,500 or so assessments um, over about five days. We do ask the same questions about um, insurance and if they're owned and primary residences, um, as well as the, the tribal question, immediate needs, functional uh, utilities. That's the main difference between the uh, IA and IA Express survey. It's just the ability to count multiple data points, uh, or multiple varying degrees of damage, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, one point. And then 
lastly, I'll take you into the public assistance survey, which is a little bit, um, it's, a, it's a longer form as Marla uh, alluded to, um, because PA is a, is a pretty complicated program, um, but we wanna make sure that we have the, the right information and we're collecting that information the right way. Um, and as you can see here, the beginning of this survey is exactly like the IA one. Collecting that same information um, so it can all be reported uh, in the same manner. So this is the difference. So as you, you perform your public assistance PDA, um, instead of looking at uh, residents, you're looking at damaged public infrastructure, um, some private nonprofits, and things like that. So um, instead of thinking of it in categories of damage, you're thinking of it in categories of work. Um, so the potential applicant would be maybe like the, uh, um, the school district or the city utility district. The type of applicant they are, and then these are the categories of work according to FEMA Public Assistance. Uh, so debris removal, emergency protective measures, roads and bridges, water control facilities, buildings, equipment, and contents, utilities, and then beaches, parks, transit, and other. Um, and so we will look at the roads and bridges since that is one of the most frequently um, uh, uh, frequent sites that are visited on a PDA. And before I move on, you can see that if I change the category of work, the questions that populate underneath that category of work change. So we have questions for each of the different categories that are tailored specifically to that category of work. Um, we also have provided some helper text in our, emerg in our uh, PDA app um, for our PA staff. Um, if, for instance, it asks this question, is this road or bridge a federal aid road? If they select yes, it's going to give them a little blurb saying, hey, just to give you a heads up, we don't necessarily look at um, facilities that are um, funded or um, eligible for assistance other, through other federal agencies. Additionally, if it's a private road or bridge, there's some helper text for that. Um, so if we say we had a road with a culvert, you can see more questions just populated below. If we have a bridge, low water crossing, et cetera, all the questions change based on that conditional. So we'll say road with a culvert. Uh, we, this would where a common name for this facility would be maybe a, you know, mile marker 29 on US 5. Um, and then you can choose the type of culvert. So maybe it's a, a circular culvert and it's aluminum. Um, and it, was it just the, just the culvert that washed out or is there actual road damage as well? I selected yes. And now I have additional questions here asking me the type of road. So we can say an asphalt road. And then this is where our staff uh, described the damage. So we can say road washout. Um, and we could go into the different types of, you know, uh, maybe it's three inches of base and it's 25 feet wide, et cetera. This is where they would put that information. Uh, the necessary repairs, that's also dimensions, materials, special equipment that might be needed to repair that site. We also do track special considerations for things like environmental and historic preservation. Um, and so if it was, uh, you know, repair, it, because the culvert, you know, helps a stream uh, pass through a roadway, maybe we wanted to identify that it, it would be occurring near water. Additionally, ground disturbing activities, uh, facilities that are over 45 years of age, hazmat issues, and then is it covered by insurance? If you select yes, it's gonna ask you for the policy limits and the deductibles because we uh, do not um, duplicate benefits. We're, we're unable to duplicate benefits. Additionally, the staff in the field have the ability to do a cost estimate because in public assistance, we're looking for a dollar figure. Um, and I won't go through the declaration process, but in, uh, in IA, we're looking at a uh, myriad of factors, one being like how many majors, destroyed, minors, and affected uh, there were in a given area. And with public assistance, we're looking at the total um, uh, repair or replacement costs for these uh, 
pieces of damage infrastructure. Uh, it asks you how the work is completed, which these all uh, line up to how our programs are delivered. Um, if emergency repairs were needed, and then they can add in, maybe there was $5,000 of necessary repairs and it's gonna cost, or emergency repairs and it's gonna cost $250,000. Um, and then how the estimate uh, was developed. Uh, additionally, we can flag it for PDA coordinator review, mark the, the location and provide photos. Um, and so those are the three surveys. Um, I will pause there and I'll turn it back over to uh, Mike. Thank you, Chris. There any Thank you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Skip forward there. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can just. Hey folks, stand by just for a second. The computer is giving me a little bit of a hiccup here. Addy, I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment so I can uh, get the uh, computer on frozen. Sounds good. Let me know if you need me to present on my end as well. Okay, will do. All right, we're back. Um, our final presenter will be uh, Melissa Jerns. She is a GIS developer here for TDM Operations Technology. And as I said at the beginning, uh, we've had six incidents now with um, using the uh, uh, Survey123 PDA app. And so Melissa has uh, learned several lessons from that experience. And so she's gonna talk about some best practices today from her experience. Hi there, uh, this is Melissa. I can't say enough how invaluable this tool has been both on the technology data analysis collection side of things, but even for the recovery staff, just being able to not have to haul around a big stack of papers. Um, some of the benefits that we've seen right off the bat, though, is being able to provide for our supervisory staff and the chief at uh, chief here at TEDM is real-time updates. And we'll get into some of the complications of being out in the field a little bit later, but really, as soon as people submit their, uh, their assessments, we get to see the numbers right away. Um, Therefore, we also, at the same time, FEMA is using the same tool that Chris developed as well as our staff. So they're looking at the same questions on uh, their mobile devices right step in step together as they go through the field, which has also been invaluable, just being able to sort of validate in the field these uh, assessments on the go. The other thing that this has really provided is because it's so user friendly uh, with just minimal training, we're able to send out uh, other agency partners as well as TEDM staff into these impacted areas. Uh, we hook them up with a mobile device 
whether it's their phone or an iPad uh, that has a battery pack or whatnot, and uh, we can send them out into the areas uh, with people that already live in those areas. So, like I mentioned, um, we're able to use these PDA results now that we've captured them electronically for other, other uses down the road. Right now, we're trying to get recovery numbers, but we can use these in mitigation planning as well as being able to sort of find hot pockets, if you will, of, of recurring loss um, pretty easily. So you've seen the tool as far as the user side of Survey123, but now that people are entering in information, we're able to look and create applications for the sort of viewer side here at the State Operations Center. Uh, using Tropical Storm Imelda as a use case, we were able to begin IAPDAs essentially right after the event occurred. They declared on September 17th, 13 counties of, of impact. We started IA PDAs on the 23rd and PA PDAs generally start up to a month or more after the event occurs because of the, we're really trying to get people's homes assessed first and then we move into the, the uh, government-owned facilities, but we were able to incorporate those numbers into our, um, our request for federal aid much more quickly than usual. So that was, that was a big win on our side. Uh, here at the bottom, you'll see applications that we've incorporated into our common operating picture that just sort of summarize the impact area and then on the left there, you'll see a, a schedule of counties that are to be assessed or have already undergone PDA assessment uh, because of the tropical storm and all the impacts. This is a close-up of our IA PDA form, how we look at it here at the State Operations Center. So we send people out with the application that you saw Chris outline. Um, with the, the guidance uh, Marla's team gives everybody once they're out there. But the people out in the field with FEMA side by side determine whether these are major, minor, affected, destroyed locations. We're able to see the points on the map so we can see neighborhoods that have significant damage uh, for later assessments down the road, we can use this information to, to know where businesses that um, have been shut down and may need like a health inspection later or other agencies and other uh, nonprofit partners are able to use this sort of uh, widespread look at the locations of, uh, you know, significant damage. But we take each of those questions that the field team fills out really directly represent um, themselves here on, with the pie charts. You can see the percentage of places that need immediate assistance or are owner versus rented. Um, and we haven't quite yet utilized the express survey that Chris showed. But I think that using that for multifamily and manufactured homes would really be a success on our end down the road. But you can see here how quickly we're able to take our numbers and then once we get uh, official IA federal declaration from FEMA, we can qualify those numbers as verified um, and then see what date we verified those numbers at. So as far as the PA, uh, like Marla and Chris alluded to, it's more about the monetary value. Um, and these are traditionally done later down the road, but we were able to send people out because of the technology uh, successes. Um, and our field, I gotta give um, a, a 
props to our field staff that send out the the mobile devices to the our agency partners that live in the areas um, that are affected. But you can see roads and bridges are definitely one of the most um, impacted categories as well as buildings, but we're able to capture an estimate of what the whole picture of the impacted area is, as well as giving the locals their own area to focus on. We can connect through ArcGIS Online and share these uh, data feeds with them to help in their disaster summary outlines. As far as working with um, staff that we don't work with day in, day out, we're able to really like hand out a quick guide and go through the steps of setting up the app on their mobile devices, getting the app up to date. Um, on the left there, you'll see just kind of a screenshot of one page of the quick guide that I've created that just kind of runs step by step, but it's really only like a two or three page guide um, that's pretty intuitive. Uh, so besides getting somebody set up with an account and the the survey on their device in the Survey123 application, it's fairly intuitive, which has been a great step and a great accomplishment of Chris's team in designing the FEMA uh, questionnaire. One thing that he didn't get into that I will say has really saved a lot of people time is setting your favorite answers. So if you're out in the field and say you're on one street and you're doing 10 or so assessments, you're really gonna not wanna type in the same information over and over. But you can go ahead and fill in as much of the questionnaire that you want to repeat um, over and over again. And then up in the upper right corner of the application, you have the option to set your favorite answers. So then the next time you go in to collect a data point, you can paste your favorite answers from that same menu up in the upper right. And that's really saved a lot of people um, a good amount of time. I think we might look into even breaking down the address fields even further. I don't know if you have much experience with the Survey123 backend, but it's all done through um, Excel, through a schema outline. So you can break down as many fields as you want and set them as required or not required. So we're able to take the application that Chris's team developed and really tailor it to our needs, but still maintain the same continuity with FEMA as they go out and do the joint PDA assessments. Another thing we noticed, which I kind of alluded to earlier, is the sending later. So if you're out in an impacted area, you're not going to have a lot of cell phone coverage. There's definitely not going to be Wi-Fi. So we, we send them out with mobile devices that have cellular when possible, but Really, the option to send these assessments out at the end of the day, once they return to a location like the EOC that has Wi-Fi or uh, reliable cellular coverage um, has been a great benefit for us. And it also saves the, the assessments on the device. So if there's an issue where the device needs to be like hard resetted or anything like that, it, there's no risk in losing the actual entries, which has been quite a relief um, on both the GIS side and the, the field members uh, staff side. One thing that I will say is a, a bit of a lift when you, if you do deploy this uh, service is anytime you make a change to the schema for the survey, you do need to have your field staff go and manually refresh the survey through the Survey123 app on the device. So if you're, ex for, for example, we had a request to expand the photo uh, capabilities from three photos to 10. 
so people can really get a good um, image of each assessment that they are doing out in the field. So, but in order to have that capability updated on each device, you have to have your field staff go into the Survey123 app and go to the area where they would download the survey and refresh it. So that's just something that needs to be communicated down through the chain of commands, but it is a step to keep in mind if, when making any changes. One thing that we have, we've done here at the State Operations Center is we've created one IA PDA survey and one PA PDA survey. So whenever we are deploying uh, field members, we're not having to have them go and find a new survey for each incident. We're able to filter it on the back end for the dashboards that we were showing earlier. So you can really kind of tailor it whether you want to filter it by date of entry or incident ID, uh, whatever works for you and your staff. Um, it's helpful to, to keep the steps on the field member's side to a minimum, like this is the IA, this is the PA, whatever incident. And often, to be honest, we have multiple incidents going on at the same time, so it really cuts down on confusion. Um, and then the big win here really is that nobody's carrying around a stack of papers. We're not waiting for entries to be mailed. Um, everything is seen in real time by the recovery staff, supervisory staff. Uh, we're getting the best picture as quick as possible. And it's a, it takes a big burden off of the field staff not having to really keep things in order. They, they're able to fill out the form drop the pit on the map, and go to the next assessment. Um, and so it, it's been a big game changer here at the State Operations Center. Great. Thank you, Melissa, uh, for that uh, good presentation. I want to just go over a couple quick resources that are available. Um, Chris had mentioned, uh, I'll send out a revised uh, um, PowerPoint. Uh, Chris had mentioned that you can also get this through your ArcGIS Online for the Survey123 templates. Also, uh, very useful to uh, look over the FEMA Damage Assessment Operations Manual. And then for groups, uh, just want to put a quick plug in. We have uh, the Texas GIS Emergency Management Work Group. It's been dormant for this past year because of everything going on with the transition over to A&M University. Uh, it's on our roadmap to get the group restarted under the Texas Emergency Management Advisory Council. And if you have an interest in uh, getting on that email list, uh, just send an email to support at tdm.texas.gov with your full contact information. And then I'm going to put in a plug for the Texas Emergency Management Conference in San Antonio from May 18th through the 21st um, and next year. And uh, we, all of us that spoke today, except I, I'm not sure if Chris will be there, but uh, the TM staff will be there and we plan to have some uh, follow-up GIS workshops at the conference. With that, I'll stop and ask if anybody has any uh, questions for the group. In the chat. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, Chris and Mike. Uh, this is Brian King again. Um, I think Addie's still muted, but uh, I don't see any questions here just right off. I think you guys might have answered everything. Let's uh, let's double check them through here. No, I think uh, I don't really see anything. Oh, we got a uh, one question here from Jamie. I want to get it typed in here. We got a few minutes. Thank you all again for doing this. Okay. Hey, uh, Melissa, uh, will there be an autofill from 911 address points? So currently, we're really trying to get our field staff team to focus on certain neighborhoods that are most impacted. And 
And I think Chris alluded to being able to reverse geocode once currently the address field is just a text field, but we will have the capability coming forward soon to be able to actually use that address field to link it to a real address. But right now we're really focused on the field staff dropping the pin in the map portion of the form at the correct location. Yeah, and another part of it is that, yes, Tenris does keep an, a publicly available address point uh, data set that is based on the 911 data uh, addresses initially, but I think it's being maintained um, more on uh, like a parcel data set level, um, but we're actually not, cannot, connected directly to the 911 call centers at the state level. Okay, great. So, um, let's see here. Um, Ed has a question. We'll go real fast. Did you upload any list on the PDAs, on the tablets? Any list? I'm not sure. Um, I think that needs a little clarification, but you are able to create, like, like uh, how when you once you choose the state of Texas, it populates the county uh, field with the the coded values of um, that state. You're able to go in and make adjustments to any kind of conditional question or coded values that you're wanting to through the back end on Survey One Two Three. That makes it really user friendly. Okay. Yeah, I think he clarified. He says kind of like an, an address list or something. Yeah. And Similar to the first clarify. question. Yeah. We don't currently have it connected to an address list. I think having the reverse geocode from the address field will be helpful down the road, but right now we're really focused on having the field member go and drop the pin on the map at the at the correct location. Okay. Well, Ed, if you need more clarification, just send us an email and Erisa, yes, Texas, and we'll we'll follow up with Melissa. So, well, everybody, it is one o'clock, and we really appreciate you appreciate you all taking the time. I know you've been busy with the the most recent emergency in Dallas and the, the heavy storms coming through. So, we we really appreciate it. Um, um, Addie, I really appreciate you uh, helping out today as I was in and out. But uh, we'll be back next month. Um, and uh, check our website uh, if you want to join us. Uh, membership, join texas.org and check us out And uh, if you want to volunteer. But other than that, I want to Mike and Chris and Melissa and, and, and others part of the team. Uh, we really appreciate everything you all do. And, and, uh, and thank you all for, for, for spending some time with us today. Uh, thank you. And it was a pleasure uh, being able to uh, share this information uh, with the, the our state of Texas GIS uh, specialist. Okay. All right. Well, we will see you all next month, and you all have a great rest of your, your week. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Great. Thanks, everyone.